Good morning. Uh, this morning we go back to the um, the series of uh, the the series of lessons that I started on before the past two weeks. Um, but thank goodness um, that we had a, a blessed two weeks. Um, the uh, uh, the pastor who shared with us about the ministries in Vietnam. I hope that you guys would um, buy the uh, Mr. Nang sauce, hot sauce. Uh, all those uh, proceeds go to supporting the, the missionary trip uh, with that pastor. And um, we had a blessed Easter service last Sunday um, with the new members praying to receive uh, Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So uh, remember to keep praying for these new believers so that they stand firm in their faith. Um, so we go back to um, what I wanted to talk to you about for the next couple of months, which is about the Holy Spirit or the, um, uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit. Um, but I wanted to remind you, I don't know if you remember, at the Beautiful Gates um, a couple of weeks ago, at the Beautiful Gates, the main lesson was that perhaps we have the legs, but we're still sitting at the gates. Um, we have the spiritual renewal. We have the new spirit person. We have salvation in Jesus Christ. We have regained our power and authority that was lost um, uh, at creation, but we're still sitting at the gates. How do we get up and walk through the gates and into the green pastures and receive all of what Jesus Christ uh, desires for us? And we do that. Um, the key is through the Holy Spirit. Um, but today, I'm going to tell you the complete gifts of all the, th uh, the, the three um, in the Trinity, which is God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so through these, um, I want you to begin to think that you are three parts and that thus far, you've lived by the normal way, which is by your perception, your what you see, what you feel. Uh, by your desires from the flesh. If your flesh is hungry, you want to go eat, um, things like that. But you, as a new creation, should be spirit-led. No longer flesh-led or what your mind thinks is right, what your heart feels is right. You should be spirit-led. And let me tell you a real example of how this, how this may work in your life. A couple of weeks ago, which, uh, thank goodness, God provided the uh, missionary pastor to speak because I had totally lost my voice. Do you guys remember when I lost my voice? Um, yes. Um, so our whole family got infected with the flu or, I don't know, the, the new COVID, the latest COVID edition. I'm not sure. But uh, my kids, one of them, I won't mention his name, but it is the middle child, um, he was so miserable because uh, normally he, around the spring, he has allergies too. So he's got runny nose and sneezing all the time. And then he got infected with the virus, whatever was going around. Then he got body aches and fever and just horribly miserable. And I asked him, you want me to pray for you? And he said, no. <laughs> and I, I didn't want to leave him at that because I taught all my children to pray. And I'm sure he prayed, except he wasn't feeling better. He still felt really crappy. So I didn't want to leave him at that part in his faith. So I told him that, you know, whatever happens, um, you believe in the word of God, that by his stripes we are healed. We keep believing in it. We keep praying, um, and we keep declaring it. So um, he agreed, and I prayed, by his stripes we are healed. Because I didn't tell him this, but this is what you can imagine is going on in your body. So the, the flesh part of you. When you are infected with a virus, when you get sick, you feel the fever, you feel the, the muscle aches, and what is going on in your body right at that moment? Those of you who are pre-med majors and, and medical field majors, you're going to learn about this. But you have an entire immune system that God has created, and there are different types of cells, white blood cells, B cells, memory cells, all those cells, as soon as it is infected and as soon as they recognize a foreign virus in your bloodstream, they go to battle. They, so you can imagine soldiers lining up for battle. Now imagine all those soldiers, like thousands and millions of these cells, are lining up for battle. And they're on the battlefront. And what would they rather hear? 
Would they rather hear, by the stripes, by the stripes of Jesus Christ, I have been healed, I am healed, I am made whole? Or would they rather hear, I'm so sick, I could die? Can you imagine the soldiers at the front lines ready to go out with their guns? And they're like, oh, commander, what did we hear? I don't know. I hear die. And then you hear all the whispering around the crowd, die. We could die. Hey, we could die. Oh, no, we're going to die. No, we're going to die. And then they're like, oh. So they drop their guns and just go back and say, I think we're going to die. Which would your cells rather hear? That by his stripes we are healed, or I'm so sick, I think I could die. So in that way, your body, it responds to your spirit. And that's one of the ways that you're, you can live a spirit-filled life. And your spirit is not just uh, declaring random things like some people say, mind over matter. You know, if you think you're going to be healthy, you're going to be healthy. No, that is a load of crap, and it borders on the occult. There is no universal power that's going to, like, when you declare it, that's going to draw the positive energy into your life and heal you. No, that is occultic practices. We declare only the things and the truth of God that is written in the Bible. Because from God's word, there is power. God created the heavens and the earth by what? By his words. So that's why we only declare his words. But that is an example of how you can turn from living based on your flesh, the way you think, the way you feel, to being led by the spiritual things of God because your spirit is made new and your spirit wants to live that spirit-led life. Now, all you have to do is learn how to live that spirit-filled uh, life through uh, fellowship with the Holy Spirit. But before you can fellowship with the Holy Spirit, you have to receive all of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, the Son, God, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. And so I want us to understand more about the gifts of each one in the Trinity. Um, and so maybe I can tell you another example that I read in his book, which is a very good book, um, why we have to um, fellowship with Jesus Christ and God and the Holy Spirit. A lot of people are attracted to the Holy Spirit because the Bible says that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power. And so... In our, in our um, you know, um, ministry, in the way that we serve God, we want that power. We want that anointing on our life. So we pursue the gifts of the Spirit, but it's not a well-balanced pursuit. Um, it's kind of like um, who here can pick up the phone and call, uh, call President Joe Biden right now and speak with him? Hong Kong, have you ever got through to him? <laughs> okay, love, keep trying. Uh, no, no, normally you can't. You can't really talk to the president. Uh, but imagine if you knew and if you were the best buddy with the president's son. Then perhaps you can, uh, you know, uh, go out to dinner with the president sometimes, you know. It's the same way like that. The Holy Spirit, God the Father, is the creator of the universe. You have to know his son, Jesus Christ. Um, to come into his presence. So it's like that. So we have to have a well-rounded, balanced understanding of all three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, first we're going to start off with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is grace? Um, grace, uh, and I read it in the book, which is a very good um, story. It's a true story. So Pastor Vlad was driving to church one day, and he was speeding because uh, he was kind of late, but then uh, he noticed that the cop was following him, um, and then I guess after speeding, he made some time, so he stopped at the McDonald's to get some coffee, um, and then when he pulled right out on the street, then the cops turned on the lights and pulled him over, uh, but the cop said that you were speeding 15 over. Um, have you, have any of you ever gotten a speeding ticket? All right, if you, like, were speeding 15 over, how much did it cost you? A lot. Um, like, I, I don't know when the, I don't remember when the last time, I, I haven't had it for a while. But if you're 15 and over, it's over 200 bucks. So I suggest if you haven't gotten that kind of ticket, don't. But if the cop says that you are under, you are speeding but under 10 miles um, over, then the dollar amount is actually less. Um, 
So the cop said he's going to, you know, write him a ticket, uh, which was just as what he got for speeding. But he's going to write him for less than 10 miles instead of the 15 over. And Vlad said that, um, you know, justice is getting what, getting the ticket, what you deserve for breaking the law. Um, and then mercy is like the under 15, um, you know, instead of the over 15 ticket that he should have gotten. He said, what is grace? Grace would have been if the cop didn't give him the ticket um, and bought his coffee for him. That would be grace. Getting stuff that you totally, completely do not deserve at all. Uh, that is grace. And so um, I want to tell you a story about Jesus Christ and his grace. It's a true story. In the, in the Old Testament, the first king of Israel was named what? First king is it? Saul. King Saul, and um, he was a mighty warrior, and he ruled for 40 years. And David was one of Saul's warriors in his army. And David and, and Saul's son, Jonathan, they hit it off. They were best friends, and they were like, um, covenant brothers, they loved each other, they made a promise to like be honest and truthful to each other and always watch each other's back. Later on, Saul was jealous of David because David killed more men on the battlefield than Saul could. So all the ladies were singing the good songs about David and not Saul. Um, <clears throat> so D uh, Saul wanted to actually kill David. Um, but um, after 40 years, um, Saul and his three sons, including Jonathan, died on the battlefield one day. And then his younger son uh, was uh, made king, but then he also got killed, assassinated um, shortly after that. So when King David became king, and after a while, he looked for people in the house of King Saul. And he found the, um, the old steward in the house of Saul, and he asked him, Ziba, is there anybody still alive? that is a descendant of Saul. And Ziba said, there is one person. His name was Mephibosheth. Try to say that. I'm just kidding. It's very hard. Um, it's in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 9, and uh, chapter 4 and 4, uh, verse 4. This child, after King Saul died on the battlefield and all his sons died, um, the three oldest sons died, his... Um, his caretaker, the baby, um, you know, his um, babysitter or the, the uh, nanny that was taking care of him, she was trying to run away because she thought the, the enemy, the Philistines, was, were going to come. And in her haste, in her hurriedness, she dropped him or he fell off of the horse or something, but he was paralyzed from the waist down. He could not walk at all. And so... Um, you know, in her fright and in her fear, she took that baby, she took that kid and took him very far away. And can you imagine him growing up all his life, hearing from this lady the fear, David's going to kill you. Don't ever let him know where you are. He's searching for you right now. He's going to find you. And if he finds you, he's going to kill you. Um, David hates your, your grandfather, um, you know, and your grandfather tried to kill him. So don't ever let him find you. He's going to kill you. Growing up with that fear his entire life, what he could have thought, what he thought about David and what's going to happen when David found him. But one day, David found him. David found him in the back reaches of some village, hiding away by this, hidden away by this nanny. And by that time, he was a grown man. But David treated him with grace. He gave him back all the land, and imagine Saul was the first king of Israel. He was very wealthy. He gave him all the land that belonged to his family. And in the Bible, it says that King David um, asked him to sit with him at the king's table for all the days of his life. He ate with King David and all the princes, which are the king's son, for the rest of his life. That is grace. So I want to tell you that true story because many of us are kind of like that person, like being watched by the cop. We feel like, you know, and we live in this fear that, oh, if we, if we give our lives fully to God, if, if we like let go of our dreams, what's going to happen? Um, you know, but know this, Jesus Christ is actually searching you out to bless you with his grace. 
Um, I tell you a very sad story. It's a, also a true story. You know, many of you grew up in this church, and um, and I watch as you grow up, and these are the conversations that I hear to a certain extent. You know, I paraphrase it a little bit. But when you were younger, some of you, I would say, hey, we're having an Easter event. Hey, we're having a Christmas event. Invite your friends. And, and you'll be like, yeah, yeah. And you're all excited about it. And then you get a little older, and I say, hey, we're having this event at church. Invite your friends. And, and what I hear is like, oh, if I don't have homework that night, I'll come. All right, and then you get a little older, and then I say, "Hey, we're having this outreach event at church. Invite your friends." Um, say, "Oh, if I'm not working that night, I'll come." And then it's almost like when you're an adult, and I say, uh, "We're having this thing at church tonight. Invite your friends." You're like, "If I have absolutely nothing better to do with my life, I will come." It's kind of like that. I don't know why or how or when we uh, we we start running away from the Lord. We think that whatever it is that we spend our time and our energy and our commitment for is going to be better than what Jesus Christ has for us. Stop running. Stop running. You can either live your life being motivated by fear or you live your life accepting the grace of Jesus Christ. Accept the grace of Jesus Christ. Give him your all. Make your life decisions based on Jesus Christ. And I promise you, it says, surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. You're not struggling. You're not chasing down the goodness and mercy of God. You're not fighting for the goodness and mercy of God. If you just receive the grace of Jesus Christ and be there with him, then The goodness and mercy will follow you. It will chase you down. It will overtake you. And your life will be blessed with God's goodness and mercy. Things you don't even ever imagine or think you deserve, you will receive. That is the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We can either accept it or either we can run away from it. And I suggest you accept it. And then number two is going to go fast. The love of the Father. So the love of the Father is is something all of us need because at the core of every human being, we talked about your spirit and we talked about your flesh. And by the way, the goodness and mercy of Jesus Christ encompasses your finances. It encompasses the money that you make, the salary that you earn. It encompasses your physical bodily health, how healthy you are, how old you're going to live, how many years you're going to live to. It encompasses all aspects of your life. But one aspect of your life is your soul. And the deepest, greatest need of every human being is to receive love. Our deepest need is to be loved. And so in this world right now, I think we have a lot of friends. We have a lot of followers. We have a lot of connections. But I think many of us are actually starving for love. Um, We're not just physical beings. We just don't need food, water, and enough sleep every day. We need something for our soul, and the deepest need of our soul is to have love, is to be loved and be accepted. And the devil offers a version of that, again, um, and it's called lust. So love and lust. Everybody say it. Love and lust. Say it again. Love Love. and lust. The two resemble each other very, very, uh, very much. Um, Imagine like um, water, clear, clean, refreshing water. And imagine bleach. Who's ever actually seen bleach, the Clorox bleach? Oh, that's kind of dangerous. I would have never imagined some of you would see Clorox bleach. But if you've seen bleach, it's completely clear right? And if you pour it in a glass, it looks just like water, right? But if you drink it, the effects are going to be way different than water. It's not going to be refreshing. Uh, It's actually going to kill you. And then uh, I'll tell you a couple of things that are different between love. Love comes from the Father, and lust comes from Satan. And they look almost the same, but very different. And here are the differences, some of the differences. There may be more. 
Love is willing to give, um, but lust takes, takes from your life, dominates your life. It may feel good. It may satisfy that need in the beginning, but then you're going to feel dominated. You're going to uh, have to give and give and give and give. As opposed to love, you just freely receive. And then the other difference, love will flourish your soul. It will make your soul like, um, like a flower in the sunlight. It's just going to grow and flourish you as a human being. Lust will actually kill you eventually. It may not kill you right away, but it will kill you um, as time goes by. Love will build you up on the inside. It will make you more confident. It will make you more happier. That Not just like the happy when you tell someone a joke, but like the true joy in your heart. That kind of happened. Love will build you up. Lust will degrade you. It will put you to shame. It will make you embarrassed. It will make you feel guilty and shameful. That is lust. And so the two look very much alike, but very different in nature. And many of us need the love of specifically the Father. That's why this is the gift of the Father, is the love of the Father, our Heavenly Father. So some of you, and I try to spin all the scenarios, some of you grew up missing a father completely, or partially, you had a father, but he was often away, often not present. Um, and then even worse, some of you had an abusive father who uh, mistreated you, said nasty things to you, um, and did not treat you uh, very good. And some of you grew up with a father who was there, who was present, and uh, they were good parents by the normal standard. But still, you feel a lack of love. And uh, Plaster Vlad described in his book, he grew up with such good parents. Um, his mom and dad were married for 35 years. They were good parents. Um, but he always felt like his father wanted him to be somebody else. Um, for the reason that his father was a, um, a carpenter, um, a contractor, and he worked a lot with his hands, and he fixed um, the uh, the houses and things like that, very handy. Oh, and by the way, this Saturday, our guest speaker is a contractor. So if you want to know about working with your hands, um, fixing things, fixing homes, um, being a contractor, his name is Clay. He's a very good friend of Chris Davis and myself. Um, and so he's going to come speak to you about um, his uh, testimony and uh, his job as a contractor and, um, and something very special that he does on the side when he has time. Um, so uh, I hope all of you can come this Saturday and uh, listen to our guest speaker. So uh, Pastor Vlad always felt like his father uh, wanted an another kind of son. And he tried. He tried his best to be that son. He came to his father's workplace. He tried to help out, but he was not very good with his hands, um, with the screwdrivers and the nails and the hammers and stuff, to the point that his father said, just go home. Just don't help anymore. Um, so he was very disappointed. And that was when um, he actually turned to God to fulfill that desire to be loved. And, um, and after it, he, he said that this is the kind of love that everybody needs. Even if your parents are good parents, they cannot fulfill that deep human need, the deepest human need for a father's love, because it can only be filled by God, our Heavenly Father. Did you know that you didn't come from your parents? Not that you were adopted or anything, but it says that in the Bible that you, children, are a gift from God to your parents. So you actually came from God himself through your parents. And because of that, only God himself, who is your Heavenly Father, can fulfill that deep, deep need to be loved in your heart. Um, so uh, one last example, and I'll move on. But uh, he gave an example of him and his wife going through this really expensive restaurant, um, you know, and, and I tell you this is true. The more expensive the restaurant is, the, the less food you will receive. The more money you will pay and the less food you receive. So the appetizer they ordered came out, and he said there's literally like five leaves on the plate. 
And uh, he was kind of upset about it. And his wife said, the appetizer is only to whet your appetite. You're going to get filled up on the main course. And so, uh, and that's true. He said when the food came out, he did get filled up. Um, but your, your earthly fathers are like that. Um, they are the appetizers. You can only get filled up completely in your soul, that deep need through the love of the Father. So I want us to um, practice experience that, uh, experiencing that. And you can do this through a number of ways, but this morning we're going to do it in a very simple way. I want all of you to close your eyes. Don't look at each other. Close your eyes and be, be quiet in your soul. And think about your father. All the good qualities that your father has or had. But then also, any of their mistakes, anything that you were disappointed in your father, and just realize that they grew up with imperfect fathers or are actually missing a father. And they did the best with you that they knew how to. So right now, I want all of you to say, Jesus, I forgive my father, and I release him for any disappointments and all the things they owed me in love or taking care of me that I should have received. I release them. Now, God, I ask that you pour into my heart your love right now. So, how did it feel? Some of you might have felt a warmth. Some of you might have felt something else. Some of you might have heard God spoke something to you. Some of you might have felt nothing at all. But by faith, uh, you should do that often. Um, and just allow time for God to fill you up with his love. And by faith, you should know, and you can know, that God is pouring into your heart his love. Um, and you can do it in a number of ways, like I said. You can worship, um, which is like just sitting down and just thinking about all the things that God has given you in your life. And then you'll begin to see how much the Father really loves you. Um, so the second gift is um, the love of the Father. And I'm going to have all of us read this verse. Um, and then we're going to move on to the Holy Spirit. One, two, three. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So imagine this. If God loved you enough to send Jesus Christ after you before you even thought about him a whole lot, and when you were in your deepest sin and being your worst version of yourself. God already loves you that much. Imagine how much more he loves you now that you are his son and his daughters. So that is the love of the father. We should love and live in that love um, every day. All right. And the last one, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. So um, it says fellowship or communion with the Holy Spirit. Um, and so what is communion with the Holy Spirit? Communion of the Holy Spirit is, um, is not conviction. It's not the things that the Holy, Holy Spirit does for us. It's not leading us. Um, if you were here last night, I was, uh, I was so glad to hear uh, Stefan's um, sharing. Um, you know, when we were lost in the mountain, when I was lost in the mountain uh, with baby, and 
people were telling him to go right, and he heard in his head uh, the voice saying, go left. That is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads us, and for Christians, um, that, is, that is normal to hear God speaking to you. Uh, but communion with the Holy Spirit, fellowship with the Holy Spirit is not, you know, hearing his voice um, and following his leadership. It's not um, uh, being taught by the Holy Spirit, getting revelation about certain Bible verses that you, um, you know, uh, have a new understanding for. It's not directing or empowering you like he said he will. Um, communion means just a relationship. Uh, it actually means a participation with or a community. Um, that's what it means. It means being a part of each other's life and just enjoying each other's company. And so what was communion like for, um, for God and people? We can look to see how communion was like when we look at Jesus Christ and his relationship with the disciples. So Jesus, when he began his ministry and he called his 12 disciples and some other people, what did they do together for three years? They walked a lot together, so they traveled together. Um, I know many of you look forward to when you start making money and you can travel together. But Jesus Christ spent a lot of time traveling with his disciples. They ate together. They slept together. Um, they talked about all kinds of stuff. They talked about different topics. They talked from farming to fishing. Um, Jesus Christ showed Peter where, the, uh, you know, where to catch all the good fish. Um, and that's when he, he got like a boatloads of fish. Um, they talked about like hard issues. They talked about um, what happens after death. They talked about, um, you know, the end of the world. Um, they, they asked Jesus Christ questions about what they wondered about. Um, and Jesus showed them how to do supernatural things. He showed them. He taught them how to do it. He sent them out to do it. They came back. They shared with him their successes. Um, they spent a lot of time living together and spending life with each other. It wasn't like two hours on Sunday morning. It wasn't that kind of a communion. It wasn't um, not just prayer and not worship. The disciples didn't pray to Jesus when he was still with them, right? And they didn't worship him either, except for sometimes they said, you are the son of God, um, out of just the you know, knowledge in their heart that this is the son of God. Um, so it was that kind of relationship. That is the fellowship that we should have with the Holy Spirit. Um, and having fellowship with the Holy Spirit is, is for all Christians. Um, who spends the money? Who of you who've been driving that spends the money to buy premium gas? Raise your hand. <laughs> yes, yeah, some of us do. Uh, because it is better for your engine. Um, or some of us like to buy just the higher-end stuff, like the um, premium car wash, uh, the $16 one and not the $14 or $12 one. You know, um, fellowship with the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit is not premium Christianity. It's not just for the pastors, for the evangelists, for those people who do the great works of Jesus Christ, who lay hands on the sick and heal them. It's not just for them. It's for all Christians, everyday Christians. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is normal Christianity. It's for all of us. It's not premium Christianity reserved for the few. And so in the next couple of months, um, I, will, I, will, I will let you know more, uh, share with you how we can fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Because after then, then our legs, our spiritual legs, will be strengthened and we can get up and walk through the beautiful gates. Uh, everyone read John 14, 16 with me. One, two, three. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Holy Spirit is the person of God who will be with us from now until we actually see God face to face. And so it's only reasonable, it's only right, it's only logical that we learn to live life and do life with the Holy Spirit um, as, he, as he has gifted us. So everyone, please stand up. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.
Dear God, our Heavenly Father, God, God, we thank you so much that um, you have given us each different gifts, God, each from you, um, Jesus Christ, your grace, um, that we can ab uh, abound in this life, that we actually have so much more. Um, if we would learn to trust in you and, and um, follow you um, wholeheartedly, God, all the things that you have bought for us um, by the cost of your life itself, um, you have freely given to us, God. Please teach us how to walk in receiving um, and in to receive your love, Father, each and every day that we live. God, we need it. Um, and God and Holy Spirit, I pray that each one of us, God, uh, we'll have that true fellowship with you to feel your closeness, to understand how much um, you love us and you're always there with us, God, and that we will never feel lonely uh, again, God. We will never feel unaccepted again because the truth is we always have you and you always accept us just as we are, God, in, in whatever path and journey that we're on in our faith, God, you're there and you love us and you accept us. Holy Spirit, um, we look with anticipation and we're excited to learn more about you and to walk in fellowship with you. I pray that you lead and guide each, of our, each one of our hearts and our entire church, God, to be a church that communes with you. You, Holy Spirit, to live in your fullness of all that you have for us, Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's sing. Praise the Father. Praise the Son. Praise the Spirit. Three in one. God. May the love of the Father, the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, and the unity of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us until we see you again face to face. Amen. And just an announcement that all the citizenship and the English classes and the guitar classes are um, uh, returning to regular schedules today. And um, next week is our guest speaker, so invite your friends. It'll be very fun and interesting. <laughs>